It is my great pleasure uh, to introduce someone from our own team in RMIT. We have a blockchain innovation hub at RMIT as we're really leaning into this incredibly important technology. Ellie Rennie is a principal research fellow at that innovation hub. Please come on to the stage. We also have one of our industry mentors on our recent course, Developing Blockchain Strategy, uh, Kirsten Jowett, has been a absolute star in that program. All of the mentors on the program are from industry, all very busy people who make time to develop our students in the course. Next one starts on the 12th of June, by the way, if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Welcome, Kirsten. Kirsten also wrote the book, uh, Cryptocurrency for Skeptics. If you maybe take that seat, we'll leave that one for Alan. Thank you. <laughs> now, one of the reasons we had the breakfast this particular week is because we have a global expert in town from our incredible partner in the development of these blockchain courses, Accenture. Uh, David Treat is on the board of Ethereum, he's on the board of Hyperledger, and he's the lead on blockchain for Accenture in the world. Delighted to welcome you to Melbourne, David, and, and onto the stage. And finally, I have a surprise guest that wasn't in your invitations. I heard Monique speak yesterday uh, at Girls in Tech, a wonderful conference here in Melbourne encouraging women into technology. A note, the panel is now more than half women. <laughs> um, yeah, <that's> pretty cool. <laughs> um, and uh, Monique was just incredible to hear from, another global expert that happens to be in town and was incredibly wonderful at doing a spontaneous joining of our panel. Monique is uh, the ex-CTO of Cisco. She's over from Switzerland this week. Uh, and she is now working as a blockchain expert in the world, but looking at its use cases in humanitarian context. So just a wonderful perspective to join our panel today. Thanks so much, Monique Murray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, one of our key collaborators on these courses, Alan Sen from Stone of Chalk, will be your facilitator today. Thanks, everyone. So sorry. Well, good morning. I hope my mic's on. It is. Good morning. Thanks, uh, as, as Helen said, for coming in in uh, a uh, lovely, typical Melbourne uh, fashion. We, we've turned on the weather for everyone, um, especially our out of town guests. So um, I'll start with a few words around uh, what we're going to be speaking about today. So as many of you uh, know, blockchain's an uh, incredibly hot topic, incredibly hot vertical. Um, I was speaking uh, in Sydney on Monday uh, out at our uh, uh, house at Stone and & Chalk, and I uh, was joking that if you add blockchain to an invite, you'll uh, double the amount of people that come uh, <laughs> to an event, and obviously uh, I, I'm proven correct again. Um, but in spite of the fact that it's, it's a hot topic, it's a hard uh, topic to pass. Um, there's a lot of hype in the space, there's uh, many people who have made uh, enormous amounts of wealth, uh, and, and people have spoken to the fact uh, pretty recently that this is probably one of the larger transfers of wealth we've seen in quite a while. But if you cut through the hype, you'll notice there's a whole range of really interesting things happening in the space. Um, and we're very lucky to have, obviously, David over uh, this week to speak about some of, oh, for today's panel specifically, to speak about some of the um, things that Accenture are doing. And, um, Really happy to also have Monique, who will give us a, an interesting insight into the work that she's doing in the humanitarian space as well. So, hard space to understand in terms of the hype versus the reality. And then I think uh, an important part of this conversation around blockchain uh, is what's actually happening here in Australia and where do we sit in the grand scheme of things. Um, I've got a view, I think we're doing quite well. I think on a global basis, uh, Australia uh, has been an innovator in the space definitely from a regulatory perspective, um, but also more broadly uh, with the amazing companies we've got uh, here, not only in Melbourne, but more broadly again in Australia. So, enough uh, from me. I'm going to now uh, begin our panel, and I like to begin uh, most panels with uh, a simple question that, that usually sets up an interesting conversation, which is, um, what are we all finding interesting in the space at the moment? Sorry, as I turn, I, I noticed that my mic's gone a bit louder, so I'll turn a little bit more this way. <laughs> so, we'll start maybe um, down that end. What, what are you seeing in space? What are you finding interesting? What are you getting excited about? 
So, um, well, first of all, I want to thank Helen, who was an incredible speaker herself yesterday. Uh, what I find interesting is what I don't know I don't know. I think it's, uh, it's fair to say that. Um, and there's so much to, to be done in, the, in this space and what is going to be, um, let, let's just say, when you're, using, when you're using the whole notion of a distributed ledger function, you have to look at what are those cases, whether or not you're dealing with multiple organizations and so on and so forth. And uh, the understanding, underpinning technology, which is large in part, let's be straightforward, uh, technical, uh, is extremely important here. Uh, you know, what are the crypto hash hashes functions? What's going to happen with quantum computing, um, especially if you're using SHA-256 uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that's really important. What I'm very excited about are things that are happening, the big problems that are solving in terms of scaling properties. And especially uh, uh, I'm looking at uh, microtransfers um, that are very interesting. Lightning Network becomes an interesting space for me. Um, and so, uh, it, it areas where pri privacy and and uh, security are very, very interesting. So what we know is problems in scaling, what we know in problems in security are, are, there are lots and lots of people, lots of organizations trying to solve for that. So that's what I'm really excited about. Great. Dave, what, what are you finding interesting? I, I think for me, um, I, I agree. I think that, you know, personally, I love getting into the technology pieces and the paradoxes that are involved in distributed ledger technology of, you know, of shared, but, um, I, I, the thing that is, has me most focused recently, though, was a challenge I was given, a, um, a, a panel was given a couple weeks ago at a conference where they said, uh, they made the analogy to, uh, we are akin to kind of mid-90s of the internet, and at that point, no one was thinking Amazon Alexa, right? And so they said, they said, they said to us on stage, said, so what, you know, how close are you to coming up with kind of the wave two, wave three of value? Because most everything we're doing right now is, is, the, um, is impactful. And, and you know, both in a humanitarian context and a developer context that is impactful, but it's version ones and it's the obvious value and it's the next phase of new products and services, brand new business models, the tr you know, real transformation that's gonna be driven that um, is uh, consuming my every, <laughs> every, every minute thoughts. Kirsten, what, what, what are you getting excited about at the moment? What are you thinking about? What are you seeing in space? So I'm most interested at the moment in where blockchain is actually being used around the globe and where it's adopting quickly, seamlessly, and without much effort to save lives. I think that's where we're going to see the first effective use cases in Puerto Rico that was sem you know, just wiped out with the, um, the, site, the hurricanes. Now there are still thousands of people without electricity. Power Ledger, which is an Australian company, is um, putting in blockchain solutions to bring energy back to the people in the entire country. And I know the UN is, with their World Food Program, feeding 100,000 Syrian refugees using blockchain technology. And I'm also excited about the real use cases that uh, companies are doing for, like IBM and Walmart, for supply chain and also for um, the, the energy sector and finally, for my work, what's exciting for me is to find the, the real intersection between blockchain and a concept, an idea. So for my students, that's what we focus on, is eliminating all the hype, moving it from, oh, the blockchain suburb down to the actual intersection of where they meet. Excellent, great. And lastly, but not uh, least, what are we finding interesting in the space, Ali? What are you seeing? Okay, so coming at it from a slightly different perspective, although I think all of those things are fascinating, right now, what excites me are some of the debates around governance. Mm -hmm. uh, blockchain mm -hmm. is essentially um, a transformation in a, an institutional economic infrastructure. Uh, we're moving into a new way of understanding the firm, um, we're in understanding uh, what organisations and companies and governments are able to do and how and how they coordinate. And um, there are some very significant questions around how that underlying technology itself is governed, but also how the layer two technologies such as Lightning Network, which are being built on top of them, mm -hmm. will be governed. So who makes decisions? Mm -hmm. How is that decision-making distributed? And who's gonna benefit? 
and we, we, it's a distributed technology, but we can't just assume, therefore, that um, it, it is going to be an equitable technology. C can I add something? Um, so now course, that we're in a conversation, <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to your very point. Uh, so first of all, I live in Zurich, Switzerland, so we have a, a lot of experimentation going on in Zurich. Uh, the one thing that I noticed about regulation is really, really key because uh, we have to take, you, you, you cannot tell banks and you cannot tell governments things will happen in, in spite of them, right? I mean, so if you poke a bank in the eye, uh, they get very nervous. Uh, and so this is not about replacing banks. Um, so I think it's really, really key. And so what happens is that when you don't understand, when leaders do not understand what it is they have to regulate, you get into over rotation on this whole notion of regulation. So uh, it's really, really key to bring these organizations along the journey. Uh, for example, uh, one of the people, I'm, I'm also on the board, uh, advisory board of Valid and Procivas.ch in Switzerland, and uh, we have a uh, parliamentarian out of Brussels who's involved in this space of, of what you do with blockchain and government. And what she's just done, she's a rapporteur of a, of a, of a group that basically got and voted together to, to have a blockchain and small to medium business working group together. So as that, those are examples where you have to bring uh, organizations on a journey, and it's true because what ha what happens is that all of a sudden there's this over rotation, and we know what happens in the United States with the SEC, um, and so on and so forth. So these are these are really really key <coughs> issues, and they're so fundamental because things are emerging, as you said, David, very very fast. I mean, um, you know, early days of the internet, yes or no? The cat is already out of the box. So uh, these are th there's a lot of great experimentation happening. Indeed, yeah, there's, there's a ton of really interesting projects and I think it, it was quite interesting just listening to the um, things that you're all uh, thinking through and, and, and are excited about in the space and one thing that I picked up along the way was a real practical one around applications to um, blockchain technology uh, and, and as Kirsten said, that's been one of the big focuses for the course we've been running is um, trying to pass the hype versus what is actually real in the space. Um, so on the project front and, and in terms of applications, David, maybe you can tell us about some of the projects you've been working on. Uh, as Helen mentioned earlier, it sounds like you've got your hands full in terms of uh, the organisations you're working with, um, not only from a pure excitement perspective, Ethereum Alliance and the Hyperledger project, um, but more broadly, obviously, with the work you do at Accenture. So do you want to just tell us maybe about some of the things you're, you're currently working on? Sure, yeah, and sorry, before I piss off Vitalik, well, I'm not part of the Ethereum board. Yeah. <laughs> I'm mm. part of the, uh, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, right. yeah. which is a group, of, a group of corporate enterprises. That's okay, <laughs> just it's being recorded, so I don't want to get the nasty crap. <laughs> um, Whoops. But, uh, but, it's, uh, but, but to that end, it's, it's you know, um, both, both the Linux Hyperledger project and the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is a, is a place where corporates and enterprises and governments and regulators and, and startups, and it, it's an entire community of organizations coming together mm. to do just that. I work on, um, in, in the case of the EEA, a practical standard that can be applied uh, to apply the Ethereum code base uh, in a corporate enterprise construct, or the Linux Hyperledger program with building, a building actual platforms to be applied in a corporate enterprise construct. And so um, I, I'd love to, talk, I'm going to talk about, I'd love to talk at first about a project um, that's, you know, here, you know, that's just all about why so much excitement here in Australia yeah. um, that, um, that I'm not going to say we're working on. Yeah, they, they, so the Australian Securities Exchange, and the step that they're taking. Um, when you talk about practical implementation, I have a huge amount of respect for the decision that the board made in December um, to move forward with what is globally the very first part of the infrastructure implementation uh, of distributed ledger technology or, the, or you know, starting that journey. Um, everything else that, uh, that has happened across the board is um, getting closer and closer to heart of the infrastructure but they're the first ones that have gone straight to the beating heart, mm. um, you know, and so uh, I have a huge amount of respect for the journey that they're kicking off uh, now to do that. Uh, um, some, some other things to reference, some inter interesting recent things. Uh, we just finished Project Jasper in Canada, uh, which was uh, Payments Canada, Bank of Canada, and the Toronto Montreal Exchange uh, taking uh, um, tokenized Canadian dollar on chain, uh, uh, um, DVP, uh, sorry, uh, directly matching against uh, tokenized equities. Um, so an on, for the first time, an on-chain fiat currency against a tokenized security 
Uh, and so that's really interesting. And the conversations around central banks, around what fiat currency and ideal team form looks like, and just the modernization of capital markets in infrastructure mm -hmm. um, is massive. Project Dubin, uh, similarly uh, in Singapore, just a very, you have a, to your point around the, the, you know, the interplay between mm -hmm. banks and regulators and, um, and the startup community. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the MAS and the AGS in Singapore have uh, talked about a very deliberate multi-phase journey where they have you know, really well thought out, uh, taking it step by step, fully engaged regulators, highly innovative culture. I see all of that here. And so that, you know, and so our focus, um, part of the reason I'm here this week and I've been here frequently is, uh, you know, really building out um, our presence in Australia because we see the innov innovative culture, the, you know, the, you know, decently, um, simple is the wrong word, but uh, you know, much simpler regulatory environment than say, you know, where I, I, I have to play back home, um, and uh, and the right set of you know leaders uh, taking bold decisions. So, um. yeah, great. So, let's dig in on a few of those. So, um, in terms of what's happening in Canada, I think that's a really interesting project. Uh, in terms of not only uh, government involvement, but more broadly trying to refine how a capital market works. So as an interesting project and probably a case in point of what the technology can do, maybe let's dig in a little bit on, on, on that one and what, what you find interesting beyond sort of the capital markets piece. Like what are the practical applications or implications of uh, a central state <laughs> moving maybe towards, um, everyone's excited obviously about blockchain technology <laughs> as well. Um, what are some of the practical implications that, that might flow from that, that for example, consumers in a room such as this might see? Yeah, I, the, so I'll talk about it for a minute. I, yeah. I, I'd also love to just get back. We have a huge focus on the humanitarian side, and that's yeah. where, kind of, from an end individual perspective, the impact sure. is really going to be most strongly felt the fastest. Mm -hmm. um, but, but let me go there. Uh, let me let me answer your question um, uh, to some degree. The the um, where the most progress is getting made in, in in financial services infrastructure, in supply chain infrastructure. You referenced supply chain um, is, is where there is a um, a central, a central leadership body that already has some form of responsibility for an ecosystem, whether it's yep. legal, regulatory, or even culture or social, you know, responsibility for an environment, taking a leadership position to modernize a platform, right. um, and then and then draw in the participants. Um, by and large, that progress is being made on a on a B two B basis. It's on a you know in, in in capital markets, it's the whole it's the wholesale um, you know the wholesale level, not down to the retail level. Um, and uh, some of that is um, is based on where the most opportunity and the most need is. Uh, you know, the financial services infrastructure is not new uh, or fresh. <laughs> um, it is, um, it is, you know, it is. And I, I've lived it for the. I, I'm complicit in why. Um, uh, I, you know, I've lived in it for the past 20 plus years, uh, where we, you know, we don't decommission things very well. Uh, we just bolt on and bolt on and integrate and. Yep. Uh, so we, you know, so um, I think I think from an end consumer perspective, um, we're still a little ways off of feeling it outside of the space of identity. Mm -hmm. I think identity is the first place where we'll start to feel it. Yeah. Great. So, so let's, um, jump, let's jump. Let's to jump to identity then. Let's identity. talk about. So some of the I wasn't. You're I saying. was. <clears throat> so um, early in May, I had a chance to go to Jordan and go to Zatari um, camp. And so, if you, um, so so identity is extremely important. It's fundamental to anything we talk about in, in blockchain. So when we talk about it from a refugee perspective, and I met uh, people from the World Food Bank and what they're doing, um, there are in interesting connotations there. So let me give you some context. In Jordan, 80,000 people are in just one camp. 80% of the popula uh, refugee population lives outside of the camp in, in Jordan. And um, there is 18% unemployment on top of it in Jordan. So you can imagine the polarities that you're, you're dealing with. Now, if you, one of the things from a World Food Program, by the way, this was the building blocks, pro this is the building blocks program at WFP. It's Ethereum based, they use uh, uh, Solidity, um, and they really want to extend it to uh, this platform to other partners within the United Nations, especially UN Women, because they believe that the network effect will be great. The accelerator program, by the way, is in, um, out of Munich in, in Germany. But the interesting thing is, is that um, the way it works is, it's, it's, you know, you have an iris scan. Um, so every, when you're registered as a refugee, you, regist you may come in and say, my name is whatever your name is. They don't care. Um, but everything else is registered on top of it, with your name, 
maybe your, 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 you have a family, your, uh, the village you're from or the city you're from, and um, your profession. There's a lot that goes on in that registration process. There's a lot of information that's captured. Most of the people that I've encountered or uh, met in the camps themselves are pretty much middle class. Uh, just bad stuff happens. Puerto Rico is an example. So here's the thing that we're working on. Uh, you come into uh, an environment, you have no provenance of your papers. How do you know you graduated from the University of Aleppo? It doesn't exist. How do you know you're a doctor? It doesn't exist. Uh, and by the way, as professionals, uh, you're not allowed to practice. <coughs> So the use case we're working on, so now I'll get to the use case, um, is with also a, a, a person who has her PhD, and she's a Fulbright scholar, she's in New Zealand, is the industry is missing 38 million caregivers. That's nurses in our vernacular. So what if you were to actually, and there's a, an entire predictor exam, to, to have a predictor exam, you sit, take these caregivers, provided predictor exams, it's, we think you're a nurse, okay? It's, and by the way, it's accepted in 200 countries, including Jordan and, and Syria. You have a fundamental paper that's produced, and by the way, we work with the local university, we could work with the local university to create a blockchain-enabled certificate and diploma program. That gets interesting, because then you start to put, um, we know hash, hashes, hash functions of what it is you, you have achieved, onto a chain itself that is forever there. That's, it's a hash, right? It's not the actual certificate itself. But that's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is if I have a certificate and I have a degree and it's, it's gotta be recognized by countries, then I want to be able to resettle. And that's the next question is to accelerate resettlement. And, um, and where countries who really need caregivers will accept them. Now that's, this is where it gets a little dicey in our, in our language here because uh, Jordan has a no return policy. So if you decide to resettle or want to resettle, it's a mental decision that you're going to resettle um, and you cannot return. And the re having conversations with refugees on the ground, that's a real hard decision because they're close culturally. Right? And, so, and so what you want to prevent is a refugee coming into Australia with no, with no profession. You want to be able to have that person on the ground operating and having a profession. So this is, these are the type, this is a use case we're working with. Uh, we've met on the, on the ground. We know, that the reg we know what they capture in registration in terms of professions. And we've met with Alibi at University, which is local outside of the camp itself. You have students who are scholarship students who are actually given scholarships to be able to attend the university. And um, so we think that will be interesting. They have a res nursing research center there and, and so on. So th this is a, in a, a really interesting case. You come out, you run with papers. Now let me take it to, a upper, let me take it to another step and then we'll pass it on here. You keep your papers where? Bank vaults, where, wherever. What happens when it's destroyed? I'm looking at what happens when an, in, in, an entity no longer exists 50 years from now. Those are the types of problems that we need to think about. You know, what does your digital uh, uh, instantiations of papers look like? We tend to want to have physical papers. How many of you in this room have an Estonian ID card? I, that's kind of a step toward where we, I think we should start thinking about. There's a lot of, to build upon that. Uh, but it means taking people along the journey. So. Yeah. yeah, sure, can I go for it? Um, I, I just, I, I think an, another dimension to this, uh, I, I agree identity is important and, and probably you know, the fundamental step that's required now to make many of the possibilities here a reality. Um, one of the presentations that I found most fascinating at New York Blockchain Week was, and, and go and find it on YouTube, was Amizi Go at the Ethereal Conference. So um, what, what's interesting about them is, is that they're really looking at financial inclusion for the unbanked. Yep. And so once you have these kinds of identity technologies that um, I suppose at some, at some level even without them, the ability to transform uh, places which are currently cash-based economies where it's incredibly difficult 
to get things done. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in places where it costs you more money to go collect your welfare payments than you get in those welfare payments. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, um, you know, where people are relying on kind of basic barter systems. These are the kinds of small scale, um, almost co cooperative existing economies that will probably reap the most benefits mm -hmm. immediately because mm -hmm. their cultural practices and their social systems are already peer to peer. And, and this is what this technology enables. We're kind of, we're overbanked in this country. <laughs> <laughs> and and we're, we're kind of heavy with, with our reliance on systems and bureaucracies. I'm fascinated in, in how these technologies might enable a different kind of development, but I, 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 as well as the humanitarian response, because, and, and, and maybe we're going to need the humanitarian response because of blockchain. If you look at where it's rolling out, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit troubled by, I think, some of the, the land title discussions. Yeah. There are studies um, that have kind of gone back to the DeSoto arguments and said that it's the elites that benefit when you try and put technological solutions. It's not women, it's not the poor, it's the people who know how to exploit those systems mm -hmm. and have the resources to do so. Yeah. So um, it might be that, that the humanitarian response is also important because of how blockchain, um, where, where it rolls in and, and where there are no adequate uh, regulatory or governmental institutions. So, so I, I think they're really interesting points and I think one of, just to dovetail in uh, to those set of uh, points, um, one of the things I commonly get from people that are new to the space is why blockchain though, right? So hashing something, sticking it into a database isn't a new uh, thing, right? Do, you're using Raft, there's a whole bunch of database technologies you could use. But what I'd like to hear, I suppose, from the panelists is why is blockchain technology interesting from that perspective? Um, I think one could take a critical view and say banking infrastructure isn't all that interesting. I, I tend to agree with you, David. I think it is, it is interesting. I think <laughs> all banks should get rid of Hogan. And I think new infrastructure is important, <laughs> right? Um, so trust me, David, I, I'm with you. Um, but why blockchain? Why not just use a database? I, I think that's a, that's a key question that I get a lot of the time. Um, and, and given uh, your expertise in the area, all of you, uh, love to hear it. So m maybe, Kirsten, did you want to start for us? Thank you. I can actually colour out a little more of your story, which was interesting and fascinating. I'll just colour in the edges a bit. Thank you. What's happening with uh, the solution you're talking about is the UN is benefiting from the blockchain <coughs> technology financially because they are bypassing, I'm not promoting this, but they're bypassing the, the middleman, the, the, the banks and they're able to use blockchain technology to give the warehouses that store the food for these refugees, <coughs> give them the information about the Syrian refugees that they're scanning the iris. Mm -hmm. So they're saving about $40,000 a month, is my understanding, um, financially for this. And what's also happening at the same time, so, so blockchain is good for their business, but what they're able to do is share that information with the next UN department, you also touched on that lately. So for entrepreneurial women or men or anybody who is in the camps or refugee to rebuild their identity so that when they, so they can start doing it while they're a refugee and so that when they can take that, they can share that with other departments in the UN and they can take that back to their new settlement where they, where they, um, where they end up, so. Yeah, David? Yeah, so at the, um, I'd love to just do this panel. <laughs> we the, we can start with ID twenty twenty. No, no, yeah. So, so, I, so we're part of we're, we are part of a public-private partnership called ID twenty twenty, which is focused wholly on this problem of the more than a billion people in this world who have no form of legally recognized identity. It's the refugees, it's the forcibly displaced, et cetera. And, and I, I, I think it'd be fun if we, if no one minds, let's continue to color this in. I mean, you, so, Monique, you referenced right the, the part of the solution pattern, and to get to your question of why blockchain is, um, it, it is a non-starter to mm -hmm. put personal identifiable information into a distributed data That's structure. That's correct. Non-starter, like it's, it's you, you will, it, it will kill people, right? This is, this They're is running away a, from um, uh, despots. You don't want to do that. Yeah, so, um, so the solution pattern that's emerged and we're part of what's also called the Decentralized Identity Foundation, it's a solution pattern that basically says what we need is a ubiquitously available identifier mm -hmm. akin to a, what, I, what IP addresses did for, uh, for computers and servers to allow the internet to crystallize its structure and grow and to identify the components. We need the equivalent identifier for humans 
groups of humans, mm. things, we were having a conversation beforehand, devices and, you know, and AI entities that will be an extensions of our identity. Mm. And that if, if there was the Dave Treat IP address against which all of my index, my information could be linked and associated, so I'm the same person, I'm the same Dave Treat definitively at my bank, my insurance company, my librarian, you know, and you know, in my, my mom's you know, scrapbook, you know, it's all linked together um, against that single identifier. Now, as early, sorry, let me paint in one more piece of that picture. <laughs> so if you have the identifier, you're able to link your data through that identifier to be definitively organized your, you know, your data. Suddenly you can introduce um, what we've touched on a little bit here, but we, we in, in the ID2020 Alliance, we talk about kind of the four Ps. You need to have, the, you know, an identity needs to be personal, it needs to be uniquely you, right? And that's where biometrics comes in. You need to be able, it's cute to create a, create a digital wallet, but unless you can definitively associate the wallet with the human, you've just created a new last mile problem. So it has to be personal, uniquely you, portable, we talked about, you know, take it anywhere with you, um, persistent, mm -hmm. meaning in the moment where I am a persecuted individual and I need to throw my data store on my, you know, let's pretend I have it on my phone, in the river to not be me to survive the next 15 minutes, that's critical, right? To be able to persist any context, and to be able to jettison your ID and then later, as you were saying, get it back. Um, and, then the, and then the last part is, is privacy, is suddenly for the first time in decades, you know, reintroduce the possibility of control over what of your data do you want to share with whom? Um, so that, you know, four Ps. They had to come up with an acronym so I could remember it. But, the, um, <laughs> um, but there's a, there's a lot of standardization work going on in this space too. You know, web yeah. of trust. Um, um, there's there's a lot of tech technology work to standardize on, on um, exactly what we're talking about. So, uh, so, but to the question of the of why blockchain, yeah. um, we we spent some considerable time saying mm -hmm. what is the right solution pattern to house that identifier, and. IP addresses are hosted on, you know, through DNS servers. Um, that is an option. We could put that, you know, that identifier into DNS yep. servers. Now, I met with, you know, we, we spent time with the governing bodies associated, and we decided immediately it was a bad idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, you know, uh, uh, or, or let me not, let me not be negative. Could be associated um, with you anyway. Let's, let's, go, let's go positive. <laughs> that, that, that the that the use of a ubiquitous, you know, the use of a public permissionless blockchain structure to house that identifier had just so many more benefits around the ability, to your point, around, um, you know, around, um, uh, around um, technologies favored the, the, you know, the, um, the, the haves versus the have-nots. If it's ubiquitously available and no authority, you know, no authority can mess with it from a government's perspective, it's, you know, it is tamper-evident. It's, you know, it just had the characteristics of working much, much better. Um, and so in that case, the, it, blockchain to house in a ubiquitously available identifier that can persist context that can persist boundaries that is outside of the control of any one authority um, and be available for all of us to use, both authorities, service providers, and individuals, uh, it's the only running option uh, to, to support this overall construct. Uh, it, it should be said it's work in progress. I mean, so, Definitely. you know, it, it, it's open source, people can participate in ID2020. Um, there's a lot going on in this space. So. I think that work in progress is a really good point. It is. <laughs> because I have serious concerns about our, uh, the right to be forgotten yep. Yep. and the way that touches uh, GDPR and the things when we build blockchains or when we build applications, because I'm also part of a startup that's building rapid prototyping for uh, applications on the Ethereum blockchain. So when we build those, we have a responsibility to think about that data, that information, whatever it is that we're building into the protocol or into the application about individuals. So I agree that it's, it's early days and it's important that we have these kinds of panels and discussions to be aware of what the problems are and the responsibilities that we have. But it, in many respects, uh, I, think, I think blockchain is, is key to these questions around GDPR because it, it is about fundamentally um, a, a new architecture and, and of the internet itself and as a result how data is managed and who's managing it and, and therefore where power resides and w it's very clear there was a great quote um, in New York I think from Joseph Lubin which was that um, our, a society's databases determine how that society works or something along those lines yeah. and at the moment um, it's very much the case that uh, those who hold and store and can um, sell data are the winners um, and, and, and we are the losers in that. I, I was fascinated to see 
Microsoft coming out with um, identity solutions mm -hmm. with their Authenticator um, app, but I think also trying to work in with these standards that are being developed around blockchain identity. And at first I was incredibly cynical <laughs> about yeah. Microsoft um, deciding to be a big player in, in blockchain. But um, it, I mean, if you think about what kind of company, say Microsoft is compared to Google, um, they're a software company um, and it, 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 I mean, they're not necessarily, they're not necessarily about manipulating our, they don't have to be about manipulating our data in the way that other companies are, so maybe um, I should give them more credit. But um, I think the what matters here is who's using data and whose business model is based on that. And then the companies that are not, and perhaps you've got stuff to add to this, and, and why they're going to be important for the evolution of blockchain. Because it's not just going to be about small, startups, um, unfortunately. Yep. It's going to be about coordination of existing economies. So I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts yeah, on so that, Dave. I, I'm, uh, my, Microsoft, uh, candidly, Microsoft is a very close alliance partner of ours. Yep. But, but in every bit, in every, in every way, um, they, you know, it was the Microsoft team that we were partnering with around identity solutions in a developer context that invited Dakota Gruner from ID2020 in um, because they personally, the team that we were, the TR2 teams felt personally Passionate about focusing on the you know the the humanitarian side of it. So um, the teams, it, I, I can assure you that the the deepest technologists at Microsoft focused on identity are spending as much time on the humanitarian and social impact side as they are on what it will do for the developed world context. So, so can I throw um, another thing there at you? Do you mind, Alan? Yeah, which yep, is go for um, it. if we if, if we're thinking about um, I suppose the, the digital economy markets. Uh, cloud. So the other huge announcement at Blockchain Week was consensus with Amazon Web Services. Um, th there were a couple of interesting announcements around what are effectively app stores. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, you know Amber Balde, who used to be with PwC, announcing. Oh, sorry, JP Morgan. J sorry, <laughs> that's what I meant. Sorry, JP Morgan uh, announcing. Um, also a kind of app store type solution to make it easier for businesses to use blockchain. But um, I think that, you know, I, I was fascinated to see, and possibly Microsoft has an interest here, but AWS and Microsoft and cloud. So this idea that if we're gonna have these new kinds of data markets or different needs around data security about where that's stored mm -hmm. and how blockchain fits in with that perhaps. Others have well, I, I, I so I have um, I am I'm ambivalent on that particular topic because uh, then you have centralization of companies involved in, in, in this, but um, uh, anything that's centralized will be hacked. Every day we wake up and we're ha we're hacked. So let's just put that on the table. We're not even at the end of the third what third quarter, and there's just so many so many hacks that are known. So that's that's the that's a, already a problem in itself when you're talking about centralization. Talking with uh, the UNHCR, my concern is that those you know they have fairly much centralized databases that they have to pay attention to, and so uh, can you imagine um, miscreant characters wanting to get accesses, access to those databases? That's a very very tough concern uh, already. So, you know, this is the polarity between what should be decentralized, what is centralized, and that's a polarity in itself. I think the issue around, I, I think it's an interesting question about micro, a companies coming in closer and closer. I have very close friends in all of those companies. Um, and, uh, you know, I spoke at the I, Internet Engineering Task Force. If I say IETF, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Um, the Internet. <laughs> So I spoke at uh, IETF 100, which was this past November in Singapore, um, and one of the questions was, what's going to happen with the internet in the next 100 IETFs? And the uh, thesis I presented was that the internet is becoming more and more centralized by, by companies. And so that has already a, a polarity in itself. Um, so is it who, quo vadis my internet, that these, are gets, these, get, these get into very, very different sets of dis discussions about um, the, the implication of who's owning which entities or which economy, which companies are starting to own sets of 
of these, of these technologies? And is it really going to be used for humanitarian purposes? Yeah, great. Before we throw to questions uh, in the crowd, um, I always like to finish uh, a panel with uh, a question that I, I think is quite interesting. We'll, we'll see uh, if everyone else on the panel thinks it's interesting, which is the Peter Thiel contrarian question, which is um, what do you believe the few other people agree with you on uh, in the blockchain space specifically? <laughs> so what do you believe that a uh, few others agree with you on? Anyone want to kick us off? I've already said basically yeah, that, that the right to be forgotten. I think our rights is very important, and I, I don't think that's talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David, you got anything that you're contrarian on in this space? It, um, it's a, it's a, it, it, I'm having trouble. Um, the, there's a complexity to that question that I, yeah. Neil was raising a little bit here. Mm -hmm. in, in the, um, it depends on the frame of reference you're coming from. Sure. So um, I spend a ton of time. You know, so we, I spend a ton of time in the um, in the in the purest end of you know of how this technology is developing. So the start of a community, the full decentralization, fully decentralized crowd, um, where we see a ton of innovation and we're engaging and, and it's important. But I live in the corporate enterprise con you know end of, end of the world where it's about taking you know every new innovative technology and applying it to you know a corporate enterprise construct. I think the thing that, that bridges the two worlds for me, and, and it gets into some of the most fascinating conversations, particularly with the decentralization um, uh, crew, is, um, is the whole notion of, I can't think of a single construct in human history where we, either from a social, legal, or regulatory perspective, can accept the notion of there's no one to fix it when it goes wrong. Mm -hmm. We just in innately have a human belief, I think, I haven't come up with an example yet of where it's okay that if it goes wrong, there's no one to call to fix it. And so my dialogue in the decentralization end of the spectrum is in, you, know, you, e you have to innovate a way to be decentralized and still have someone to call to fix it when it goes wrong. And please don't tell me it's not gonna go wrong because if there's <laughs> anything we've ever proven is it always goes wrong. Um, and so, um, so I, I, we're thirsting for that innovation to that end of the technology around how can you have more decentralization and yet that ability to fix it when it goes wrong. It's not there yet. And that's why I think we, we're seeing the slowness of the two worlds coming together. Now in the corporate enterprise construct, we've solved that easily. I mean, uh, so my, you know, off-chain data structures, the ability but to simul simultaneously segregate data and encrypt it to address the, you know, the average lifespan of any encryption construct is, uh, I, I had the debate with the guy from NIST uh, left two weeks ago, three weeks ago, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's eight to 10 years. So yeah. if you're gonna put, if you're gonna adopt a mindset of uh, I'm only gonna protect my stuff with encryption, it's cool if you're good with anyone reading it eight to 10 years from now <laughs> um, in its full glory, which is fine in certain mm -hmm. circumstances. But you know, so the corporate enterprise structure, we've, we have figured out ways to apply this technology in a way that meets our Security standards are, you know, our you know, service model standards can modernize, can change the nature of intermediaries dramatically, mm -hmm. I mean, dramatically. Um, but I, I love spending time at the at the at the decentralized end, trying to find ways to you know, get more and more creativity around how to fix it when it goes wrong. If there's nobody in charge, right? If there's a fully decentralized model. Right. So <coughs> contrarian views. Um, prisoner's dilemma. Now, seriously, I don't think we understand crypto economy very well and what that really means. I mean, Vitalik is very much into this space, but um, what motivate, we are the passions, we are the slaves of our own passions. And so I think we need to understand what that means um, from a crypto economy perspective. And um, I think gamification is an interesting aspect here that we're not paying attention to. Ellie? That will be music to the ears of my economist colleagues in this room. You've <laughs> made some people very happy. <laughs> For me, uh, as not an economist, um, I, I think I think I'd take on Vitalik. I'm going to aim high here, and um, I think I, I, I don't fully believe that we can automate our way out of our problems, and um, the idea that by putting things into code and creating rules, we can um, make life better and easier. I think the social aspects of the challenges we're facing are going to be just as important 
the institutions we create around blockchain are going to be essential to um, the social outcomes. For instance, I would say something like Materium with an M is worth looking at, uh, particularly if you're a lawyer, uh, because that is about the adjudication processes that surround smart contracts or what kinds of s smart contracts need to be developed um, and really interrogating the risks of them, understanding that our current court systems and legal systems are not fitted out for this. So um, those kinds of developments, I think, are going to be just as essential as the technology itself. So my challenge is that um, the technology is, is not the determining uh, piece of this puzzle. Great. Can I offer one more, Alan? Of course. I, the last thing Go I would it. say about that is, and it's controversial, is I believe permissioned and permissionless blockchains can play well together. Oh, yes, I agree. I agree. <laughs> What a lovely uh, note to throw to the crowd. We can, we can all, uh, all the chains can play together. Let's uh, go to the crowd. We've got a mic out in this corner. Who, has, who wants to be brave and ask the first question? Jason, go for it. Hi, thank you very much, amazing panel. Um, I'm Jason from the NAM Blockchain Protocol. And my question is, how do you see being quite well-traveled and understanding the ecosystem, how do you see Australia compared to the rest of the world? And Australia traditionally has been good in financial services, marketplaces, software, also agriculture mining. But in the blockchain space, how can we be a leader here itself? Thank you. I can take a shot at that. I think, look, I think Australia is doing well by providing clarity where a lot of countries are not. And that's our advantage right now. Um, you need clarity so that you can do things and know you're not going to go to prison. So, you know, that, that's really important. Um, so thank you, Asik. Um, I, but I would say if, if you look at, look, I, th I, think, I think we're doing well, but we're, we're not at the top. And I, I would look to Dubai for direction here because they are moving government to the blockchain, they're moving registries to the blockchain. And the real innovations are going to have to integrate with those regulatory layers in order to be able to do really amazing things. So I'd like to see um, our public service be doing more. David, maybe, maybe a comment from you, given uh, you're here obviously at, in part through Accenture and, and uh, pushing forward growth here in Australia. Yeah, th this is a priority place for us to, to grow our capability and team. I've got a bunch of the team here and, uh, and we're um, it, it really, um, it, candidly, it has started with the, the, you know, fin the, the world's the financial services infrastructure, capital markets infrastructure eyes are all on the ASX, right? And so this, this is, what's happening here is extremely important. I think it's gonna set a model for other journey, you know, other regions and other journeys. And the degree to which there's, there is uh, cr um, cross you know, global dialogue around the, con you know, the connections and the relationships, um, you know, uh, whether it's through the through the startup community and the work you know digital asset has done start you know here and in other places or or regulator to regulator or banking system to banking system, um, this is one of the most important voices and uh, and you know epicenters of real things happening from a financial services perspective. Um, but I think more broadly, uh, just the you know, um, and I, I'm learning more more and more about this. So I think it's probably my my 10th trip here in the past two and a half years or three years, but um, uh, the, the, just the, all the right ingredients are here, right? You've got a highly innovative entrepreneurial culture, uh, you know, a, you know um, the right dialogue starting to happen. I think more of it, you know, more of it's needed and certainly other, you know, um, you know, there's other, you know, there's, there's other places where there's more of different dimensions, but on the, on the whole, I think you've got all the right elements, you've got all the right ingredients, you've got a huge, you know, innovative entrepreneurial <coughs> culture, a defined environment, right, um, where you don't have some of the complexities that, uh, that others do, particularly from a regulatory perspective. Um, maybe that doesn't feel that way, but come to the U.S., it's a... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, yes, I, I think important things happening, uh, you know, leadership, uh, you know, real leadership, real innovation, uh, and a defined environment. Uh, that it's a bit of a Goldilocks syndrome. You know, uh, it's it's you know not too hot, not too cold. This is a major, relevant top ten economy that can do real things as a model for the rest of the world. Yeah. I, I'll add something to this. So I think 
we underestimate in Australia how far ahead in many ways we are from a regulatory mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that was really surprising to me last year when we went to consensus was uh, when we spoke about the regulatory environment that was here a year ago, many people from different countries around the world were, were saying to me, that's actually very progressive. So I think in many ways Australia's a hugely progressive country in the regulatory front. So a few data points, so Australia's second country in the world to bring um, a digital currency into our uh, indirect tax uh, system, uh, the GST Act, um, and that was by way of legislative change. So, um, and if anyone knows anything about the structure of GST, it requires consent from all the states, it's, it's work, right? Um, but universally acknowledged that that was an edge case and that we needed to change that because digital currency in many ways is the currency of the future. Um, and so there's that, and then AML, CTF, so anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing, uh, again, uh, inserted into the act, so legislative change, um, we have uh, digital currency in there as well. More broadly, um, ASIC has been uh, relatively progressive in the space, releasing uh, work uh, to, to help clarify, uh, for example, in, in the ICO space, uh, what an ICO might trigger from a, a financial services law perspective. Um, later this morning, uh, Treasury are doing a roundtable around ICOs that I'll be at. So I think from a, a broad uh, perspective from a regular, on the regulatory front, uh, Australia's very progressive. One thing that's probably under discussed in this space is um, how thoughtful Australian regulators are. Um, so data point, uh, in the US when the IRS released their first uh, bit of uh, regulatory notice around the treatment of digital currency, it was probably about a page, two pages long. When the ATO released their, uh, their rulings in, in this space, um, they released uh, five, and each of them were about 10 pages each, mm -hmm. right? So thoughtful, very thoughtful, and, and on the law actually, uh, in my personal view, um, correct, right? So it, I think that's one that we sort of under, uh, under discuss in Australia, is our regulators are very thoughtful, and actually um, probably towards the edge of, of um, the space. They're really understanding where the um, blockchain space is going. Can I add to that, Alan, just quickly off track as of well. Course, I've done yeah. wonderful things just April 11th. Uh, they made uh, cryptocurrency digital exchanges fall under the... Um, AML CTF. Thank you. <laughs> and, and ADCA. So it's, and, and right. So it's very, very clear. Yep. If, you're, if you're thinking about using blockchain in your business, it's a good environment. It's safe. It's clear. It's simple. Yeah, it's worth discussing because, I mean, as David said, in the US, probably one of the big hurdles um, to adoption and, and the challenges for a lot of startups have been on the regulatory front. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in part because of the structure of, of US financial services law as well. You're sort of um, either pregnant or you're not, in the sense that you either are, if you're releasing, for example, a token uh, security or you're not. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in Australia, we have a sort of a slightly different regulatory framework around um, treatment of uh, financial services products. So, you know, the, the just inherent differences, but by the same token, um, the SEC has probably been a little bit more um, combative in, in the space than ASIC. Um, but yeah, sometimes, sometimes, that's a view. It's, sometimes it's are you are you or you're not or are you again? No. Yeah, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, questions back back to the audience. Yes, maybe Dan. I've got an ad boy. Oh, please uh, go for it. Then. That helps. Uh, but I'm particularly interested in the uh, how you see blockchain as a use in research, particularly very large distributed data, let's say genome or proteome mm. or, or neuroscience mm -hmm. uh, applications. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really cool. So there's a really cute. There are a couple of companies working on this, um, and a really cute, cool use case. I'm not sure if you're taking it in this direction per se, but I was staggered by the stats on how much uh, university research is lost after five or six years. And it's just gone, right? The, I mean, the, all the hard work, all the, we are hemorrhaging our knowledge is basically the gist of it from what, the, from what some of these stats um, convey. And so a few companies have picked up on the notion of if we could use, the, if we could use a blockchain-based structure to be able to capture, crystallize, have the full, full provenance of that data, um, you know, where you put the actual data if you use you know, IPFS and that's a link to it. I think there's some creativity being applied but I think just the general sense of having a shared data construct to be able to support the preservation, pre preservation is like level one, like let's preserve the knowledge, but also the, the just creating whole new ways to be able to um, create the linkages and the, and the insights and the analytics and the, and the depth of, um, of, yeah. Can I speak to that? Because biome, the gut biome is a perfect example of that. 
Yeah. Well, in, in five seconds, I think the interplay. Sorry, no, I think okay. the interplay between one of the things we're, we're working on right now is the interplay between big data systems and analytics and blockchain, right? Because blockchain does not solve all problems, and you know, and, and the, the interplay between the two is really fascinating. As you come up with insights and critical data elements that you want to be able to crystallize and preserve that full provenance of, and you can take advantage of a blockchain-based system. Well, then the interplay back to a data lake where you want those insights and the fluidity of data to, to thrive is a really interesting pattern. The, the, the quick response here is I, um, the other side of me that you don't know is I am an associated researcher in Bo Berlin. And so I'm working with um, uh, some physicians in this space. Um, and they're looking at, they're looking at creating a, a, for medical research, an entire uh, blocks, blockchain for research uh, that which the data is anonymized is really very important from a research perspective because as long as you have anonymization of that data and purely anonymized, uh, becomes extraordinarily interesting from, uh, from that perspective. I Sorry, think can I pile on the, the, the other side of that because it's, it's incredibly exciting is you, can, you have the fully anonymized data and you have researchers that come up with insights, yes. but if it's fully anonymized and you realize that person has cancer and you can't get back to them, you can't unanonymize, um, the, the technology allows for that. So some really really interesting work being done on homomorphic encryption yes. and the ability to, um, you know, and uh, you know, th there are a couple of things coming out soon that would allow for that confidence and full anonymization to, to support the research, but then the ability for the right people to be able to unanonymize and, and help where or connect. And, and recall it's Berlin, so it's Germany, where privacy is extremely heichel in German. Um, that becomes, but it's, it's to your point, uh, the you know, if you, there, the, the capability is there, yeah. I think one of the missing links in the ecosystem generally is um, uh, organizations or um, collaborations that enable good data use. Um, so th these dis where, where the, the, the blockchain discussions meet the ethical data discussions and being able to delegate or permission your, the use of your data for specific purposes and not others, so science clearly would be an ethical use. Uh, but how that is going to be managed, I think, is a key question and who's going to take leadership in that. I think there's definitely a role for the research community there. Yeah, there is. So as much as I... Are we going to do one more question or are we going to... Yep, yeah, sorry. I'll hand over to Helen. Go for it, Helen. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm conscious that... We said 8.30 finish and that you need to get to work. These, um, these discussions, I mean, every great technological advance um, creates great opportunity but also great risks. And I think the panel today uh, took us deeper than I've been. Um, every time I go into this topic, my brain melts. I don't know how you guys are going. Um, but uh, this one went really deep in terms of the responsibility of understanding these technologies and, and treating them with care. So um, an incredible panel. Thank you so much to you all. We have some gifts. I hope the international travellers have time to, um, to drink it while you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you thank for you. your... Thank you very, very um, much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Davis, our fantastic collaborators at Centre. Our superstar tutor. <laughs> Excuse me, Ali. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and Alan. Awesome. Um, many thanks for coming. And um, this, our vision at uh, RMIT Online is to build a community of lifelong learners successfully navigating the world of work. Um, you've joined our community today. Thank you for coming. And boy, uh, I learned a lot, and I'm sh I hope you did too. Thank you. Thank you.